Okay, welcome. Um, so I'm going to be recording this tonight. Um, I'll turn it off when it's your time to speak. And if I don't do that, please remind me, because I have a tendency to forget these things. Um, I don't think it's any surprise what I'm going to be talking about. Um, I just gave you a little bit of a clue. Uh, this, is, this is a koan um, from the Blue Cliff Record. Um, it's called Case Number One, Bodhidharma, Clear and Void. And it says, Emperor Bu of Rio asked great master Bodhidharma, what is the highest meaning of the holy reality? Bodhidharma replied, clear and void, no holiness. The emperor said, who are you in front of me? And Bodhidharma said, I don't know. The emperor did not match him. Finally, Bodhidharma crossed the Yangtze River and came to the kingdom of Xi. Later, the emperor asked Shiko for his view. Shiko said, does your majesty know who this man is? The emperor said, I don't know. Shiko said, he is the Mahasattva Avalokiteshvara transmitting the seal of Buddha's mind. The emperor regretted and wanted to send an emissary to invite Bodhidharma back. Shiko said, your majesty, do not intend to send an emissary to fetch him back. Even if all the people in the land were to go after him, he would not return. Now, this same koan is um, presented in another book called The Book of Serenity, where it's the case too. And this one says, Emperor Wu of Liang asked great teacher Bodhidharma, what is the highest meaning of the holy truths? Bodhidharma said, empty, there is no holy. The emperor said, who are you facing me? Bodhidharma said, don't know. The emperor didn't understand. Bodhidharma subsequently crossed the Yangtze River, came to Shaolin, and faced a wall for nine years. So, um, I was first introduced to th this koan a number of years ago, and it was completely, I couldn't penetrate it at all. It was just completely dense. I had no idea what it was talking about. And, um, you know, the koan study is um, a big part of, there's two, there's two schools of Zen. There's the Soto Zen, of which this temple is a part of, and there's Rinzai Zen. And Rinzai is really focused on koan study, and Soto is focused on sitting meditation. But Soto also studies koans, and, and Rinzai also, also sits. Um, so you study them, uh, because a lot of the language and a lot of the situations and, and who these people are is, is fairly unknown. And it's, so if you kind of don't know the backstory on these, you kind of don't really know where, what they're getting at. So that's part of the study. But the thing with koans is that we're not trying to solve them. We're not trying to figure them out. Um, we sit with them and let them sort of open up, um, if you will. Um, and so there's no, there's no right or wrong. Um, so, so this koan, like I said, it came from the Blue Cliff Record, which is this book here. It's a collection of a of a hundred of these koans that was put together in China um, <coughs> in the eleven hundreds, and then Dogen took them to Japan, and um, the other book was uh, written about that same time with these same koans, and 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 they're about this guy Bodhidharma, who is an interesting guy. He um, supposedly brought Zen meditation from India to China, maybe 100, 100 years before this was written. The deal is, they don't really know if he actually existed. You know, he, he may not be real, um, because it's, it's actually kind of unlikely that one person brought this. So it, it's, he's probably an amalgamation of a number of different people um, over time, men and women. Um, but he, he's kind of a symbol, so he's kind of, he's kind of useful that way. Um, so, so this, this koan in particular is, is studied a lot when people are going through a, 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 a training program called a shuso, and, um, which is why I, I'm talking about it tonight. Because at the end of your shuso training, it's traditional to give a talk on this koan. So I'm going to try to, to kind of give some reflections on what I think, what I think what, what it brings up for me, not, not what it means, what it brings up for me, and how that's related to recovery. So please, uh, please bear with me. Um, you know, I think 
for me, what this what this whole koan is, it, it's Bodhidharma kind of showing us his ver- his view of the world. It, is how I is how I look at it. Um, where it says, um, in Pur Wu of Liang asked the Bodhidharma, what is the highest meaning of the holy truth? And he said, empty. There is no holy. Um, you know, this is this is the emperor having a Dharma discussion with with Bodhidharma, and and what he's saying is, you know, what what is the greatest truth in all of this and all of this stuff that we're doing here? And he said, it's emptiness, and that's one of the one of the key um, factors in in Zen. Um, and and what he's saying here is that it's not holy, and I think that is great. Um, I think that's wonderful because what it says is that emptiness is in the everyday. It's in the mundane. It's not some holy thing that's reserved for a, a priestly class, if you will. And in a nutshell, what, uh, as I understand emptiness, it's that um, there's no... Um, that everything is interconnected. Nothing exists independently, just sort of floating in space. You know, everything comes from something, everything goes to something, everything is intimately connected with everyone they've run in, into um, contact with in their entire life. And, you know, just by being here tonight, you're influencing me, and I'm changing you, and you're changing him. And this is, this is the way we go through life. And I think this is important, I think this is a really important concept for people in, in recovery because I know that, that my disease tells me that I'm isolated, and it tells me that, um, that nobody cares, and it tells me that, that it's hopeless, and it tells me that, that I might as well use, I might as well drink, because this is just the way it is. And, and actually what emptiness says is that recovery is possible, that there is an abundance of help available for you, and I think, we, I think we all learn this as we come into recovery and, and we're part of a fellowship and we come here and we're part of a sangha and realize that at any time there's innumerable people that are, that are waiting to help you. And that's, and that's the interconnectedness that, that I think this is talking about. Um, then the piece where the emperor says, who's facing me? And Bodhidharma says, don't know. Um, to me, this reminds me of, of the concept of no self that we also in, in Buddhism, and and no self is basically that there's no soul, that there's no unchanging me. I mean, obviously, there's this collection of atoms and and function and body here, but but there's nothing that's unchanging. There's no self that you can find that doesn't change. I'm a different person than I was before I walked in here. You know, 13 years ago, I had a needle in my arm. You know, that changed. And, and that's, you know, that's what this, this um, I think that's what this is talking about. We're changing all the time. Um, then the next thing this says is, uh, Shiko said, he is the Avalokiteshvara, Mahavatsa Avalokiteshvara, transmitting the seal of Buddha's mind. So Avalokiteshvara is the Bodhisattva of compassion. Um, in the Heart Sutra, it says, um, Avalokiteshvara, Bodhisattva, who doing deep prajna paramita, perceived the emptiness of all life and was freed of pain. So, so what this is starting to give us a hint is that, that there's a way out of the pain that, that underlines life. It's a part of life. It's a part of, it's a part of our addiction. And, and what this is starting to show is, is that there's a way out of this. You know, there's, there's another story um, in, in this book also but between the emperor and Bodhidharma. And the emperor says, the emperor had gone around and was building temples and giving money and supporting monks and, and doing all these good works um, to accumulate merit. And, and the emperor declared, since, since my accession to the throne, temples had been built, scriptures copied, and money saved without number. What kind of merit has that accumulated? And Bodhidharma said, no merit, nothing. It accumulates nothing. Um, which is kind of, <coughs> kind of harsh, kind of harsh. And, and I think what that's saying is, is that there's, there's no way out. You know, you can't spend your way 
around suffering. You can't you know, do enough good works that you won't experience suffering. It's part of the human condition. And, you know, you know not getting what you want is suffering, so is losing something you have. Um, repeating painful relationships over and over. Um, a lot of time, getting, getting what you want has suffering in it. Um, falling in love has suffering in it. Because if you have two people that are, that are you know, deeply in love with each other, as wonderful as that is, unless they happen to both die at the same time, one of them is going to go first, and that's going to cause pain for the one who's left. So the seeds of, of, of suffering are there. Um, and I, I, I think addicts know that probably better than anybody. Um, so another part, the emperor regretted and wanted to send an emissary to invite Bodhidharma back. Shiko said, Your Majesty, do not intend to send an emissary to fetch him back. Even if all the people in the land were to go after him, he would not return. And you know, that's, that's the piece that, that I really didn't understand. It's like, it, it's, it's prominent in this, but, but, but so what? Why, why wouldn't he go back? And I think what that's talking about is that um, you know, everything changes and there, there is no going back. Um, you know, it, it talks about a conflict called impermanence that, that we, that we um, that's a big part of, of Zen as well. And that impermanence basically says everything changes. Everything changes. There's nothing that stays the same. And that is really, really good news for recovery. And that's the basis of the second step. Is the second step basically, if you want to, you know, shrink it to a post-it, says that that recovery is possible. You know, um, and it's possible because everything changes. Now, I, you know, I, I'm an alcoholic. I, I'm not going to change that. But what does change is how that plays out in my life. You know, I'm not a drinking alcoholic anymore. Um, and that's and that's that's the, that's the recovery, um, you know. And if, if if we can get that, you know, it's another another way you hear that said is that um, hmm, just drew a blank. Sorry, um, you know, if we can get that, we cling less to outcomes and expectations. You know, this too shall pass. That's what I was thinking of. We hear that a lot. This too shall pass. And then the last piece of this says Bodhidharma subsequently crossed the Yangtze River came to Shaolin and faced a wall for nine years. So in, in, in the story, um, Bodhidharma, after he left the emperor and crossed and went to Shaolin, he went to a cave and he sat down and he meditated for nine years without um, sleeping. And to keep himself from sleeping, he cut his eyelids off. And then he threw his eyelids down on the ground. And where, he, where they landed, tea bushes came up. And that's where tea comes from. That's, that's the story. So that, that's why I kind of think that maybe not every detail in his biography is, is accurate. But you know, I, I could be wrong. Maybe, maybe it was. So, so this idea that he's, he's facing the wall for nine years. Um, and he's not going to go back to the emperor. Um, I think what that's talking about is he sat Zazen for nine years. That was, I mean, this is the summation of this story. And I think what, that, what this is saying is he had the chatter with this emperor, you know, and he had this you know, other stuff coming on, and, and all these other things are kind of coming up. But at the end of the day, he sat Zazen, and he sat Zazen for nine years. And then at the end of that nine years, he was enlightened. And, you know, talking was over. You know, all there, all there is to do is, is sit. And I think that's, that to me is the most fundamental thing I get out of this, is, is that sitting is the foundation of everything else we do. And, um, you know, that comes around to the 11th step. I think it's why, why meditation is such a powerful tool for, for, for people in, in recovery, is it gives us that calm ground, that calm space that, that we can live on. Um, so that's about all I'm going to say on this, actually. 